Welcome to the Empowering Parents program. This is the Crisis and Connection session two. What we're looking at is identifying what invalidation is and what statements you make that are invalidating that might be escalating or holding crises for longer. I want to start off by discussing emotional vulnerability and dysregulation. If we think about emotional vulnerability, that is the biological sensitivity to emotions. So when you think about it in regards to the way our bodies ex are experiencing even temperature, we all can experience temperature in different ways. We can be sitting in the same exact room exposed to the same exact temperature yet some of us are going to be experiencing it a little bit colder some of us are going to be just right and some of us are going to be on the warmer side the same experience in life applies to our, our emotions as well and that's important to recognize because we will take the way that we experience emotions and apply that to our young person when they don't experience emotions in the same way that we do and so when we look at what dysregulation means, dysregulation is that biological sensitivity. It means that they're going to respond to events that other people's brains just kind of filter out. They are going to have a higher intensity emotion than others around them. So they experience emotions more powerfully than others. And their brain takes longer to regulate and return to what we call baseline. Where were they idling before that stressor occurred? That can be hours and that can be days for some folks and weeks for others. So when we look at the brain ability to, to process emotion. We're looking at those three components that create that dysregulation. So they usually have the sensitivity, the intensity of the emotion, the slow return to baseline paired with the inability to regulate their emotions. They don't really have control over that dysregulation. You can see the sensitivity, like the biological vulnerability in some people, and yet they have control over it. We usually call those folks like the more just emotionally sensitive folks, and you'll you'll know them by interacting with them. They express their emotions pretty often, and you can see and um, they you can see that they're experiencing their emotions more powerfully and more sensitively than others. Yet they can have that control over it. This creates just a biological vulnerability, but with Someone with emotion dysregulation, they have all of that paired with the inability to regulate. And that is their work to do is to figure out how do I regulate this biological vulnerability that I have. So oftentimes because of dysregulation, people will find ways to regulate and that is usually through higher intensity behaviors like suicidality, self-harm, disordered eating, uh, substance use, reactivity, promiscuity, you kind of name the behavior that's a higher intensity behavior that usually quiets that level of dysregulation. So when your young person's upset and they're either already dysregulated emotionally, or you can see that they're heading in that direction, there is one surefire response or reaction that they can get from you that we know will escalate the situation. This is called invalidation. Invalidation spikes anyone's physiology. It's kind of a human response that they've studied that even in the most basic of invalidating responses that you can receive, our heart rate and our muscle tension increases. So when you've got an emotionally sensitive person and they're dysregulated at that current time and they lack some skills to regulate, Throwing invalidation into the mix is going to amplify and it's going to keep you in that crisis for longer and keep them in that crisis for longer. So what is invalidation? Invalidation is communicating that someone's thoughts, feelings, and actions do not make sense. We can provide invalidation intentionally. We can also provide it unintentionally. Invalidation is really easy to do, and once you see it, you will hear it often. When I first learned about invalidation, I thought, oh, even when I'm being empathic towards somebody, I am being invalidating also. It's a skill that we have to acquire to be able to recognize and then to change it. The next session will focus on what validation is. That's the opposite of invalidation. So as soon as I learned what invalidation was and what validation is, I was about to become a parent for the first time and I decided 
I was not going to invalidate my kid. Nope, I've already, I, I understand the impact of it, the consequences of it. I'm not going to do that. You want to guess about how long that lasted? Seven months. My son was seven months, but when I at least recognized the first time that I invalidated him, I still remember he was crawling around and he fell a little bit. He kind of tripped over his hands and he started wailing. And I picked him up and I cuddled him and I said, oh, it's not that bad. And it was in a nurturing tone, yet it was invalidating. And at that point, I realized this is going to be a lot harder than I anticipated it to be. What I was really saying is that he wasn't bruised, he wasn't bloodied, he wasn't sprained, he wasn't going to have a long-term consequence. Yet the pain and maybe the fear or the stress of the fall was valid. He was experiencing that. I cannot come in as a different human being and say, you're not experiencing what you are. So this was a really valuable lesson that I can't avoid all of my invalidating comments. They will happen. What I want to do is, is remain committed to not invalidating him, to making sure over the years that I recognize what types of invalidation are the most harmful to my, my kids and how to repair and correct the invalidation as it happens. Because you're not going to be a perfect human being and you're not going to be able to kind of eradicate all invalidating statements, especially when faced under such intense circumstances. So again, we're going to notice it when it happens, a lot of mindfulness, try to communicate more clearly what I'm trying to say, make repairs as I need to with the invalidation that I've given. Again, try to stop the most damaging invalidation. Some invalidation, it won't really impact a whole lot. And yet it's still important to recognize we want to try to keep our invalidations down to a super low frequency. Your emotionally sensitive young person is going to register even those low level invalidating statements. Keep in mind that you're human. You're not going to be perfect and we need to kind of shape your own behavior and make your own changes over time. So just kind of follow these steps. Now let's look at some types of invalidation and kind of use this worksheet as we work along. We're going to look at what the type is, what it means, and then I want you to take some time to make comments on this worksheet as to what ways do you use this type of invalidation or communicate this type of invalidation to your young person. That way, again, if you can name it, you can tame it, and then you can change it. So we're going to start with the first one on the list, which is blaming, where we place the blame on the person for the crisis or for the behavior. You might have said or thought statements like you always ruin things you shouldn't have done these you should have done things differently and this wouldn't have happened really placing blame and i want you to pause for a moment write that down and think about how it has impacted your young person to hear this type of blame Let's move on to hovering. When you attempt to kind of vacuum up any feelings you are uncomfortable with or not giving truthful answers because you don't want to upset them or for them to feel vulnerable, right? This is that kind of helicopter parenting we've mentioned in walking the middle path. Things like you did a great job, your friends aren't upset with you, you're reading too much into it, when it's clearly not the case. Their friends are ignoring them and not taking their calls. Right, where we try to hover and maybe at times it's that kind of toxic positivity where you try to speak to the positive or you try to, um, well, we'll get into denying, but where you just kind of vacuum up all those feelings and, and make it a reality it isn't. I want you to pause and think, what is that type of invalidation that you've experienced in terms of what you think and how you've responded and what impact do you think that that has had on your young person? The next one is judging, where you attach some type of label to their behavior, where you take a behavior and you make it bigger. You're a crybaby, you're attention seeking, you're dramatic, you're overreactive, you're being too OCD. Here we go again, crying over nothing. What are some of those judging types of statements that you have made or thought? And what is the impact you think that that has had on your young person? 
denying. You respond with saying they're wrong for how they feel, that they didn't actually have this experience happen. You've eaten so much, there's no way you're hungry. You deny their experience. You deny their body sensations. You're not sad. I know how you are when you're sad, where you really just deny their experience. What have you engaged in? And how do you think that has impacted your young person? Minimizing. Minimizing is telling the person it's not as big of a deal as they're making it out to be. You might be correct in terms of their emotion Their emotional intensity does not match the intensity of the situation, and yet they're still experiencing it anyway. So minimizing statements might be, it's nothing, it's just one test, you won't remember this in a year or so, it's not really that big of a deal, where you just try to make whatever they're expressing a lot smaller. What are some of the ways that you minimize? And how do you think that has impacted your young person? Fixing is invalidation. When we try to come in with problem-solving strategies, what we do know from evidence, even, even though it can be helpful to offer effective solutions, it actually lands in our nervous system as invalidation and stressful. So it's going to increase the distress. If you're trying to lower distress, we try to avoid fixing upfront. So fixing your feelings or fixing your problems also means that you don't allow them to have the feeling. Maybe they can engage in the problem-solving strategy, but they also need to feel the emotion and be able to regulate it. So fixing the feeling away. Oh, you're sad. Let's go get some ice cream. Let's go on a vacation. Let's change that feeling. You don't need to stay in this feeling, essentially. We need to get away from it. Don't feel that way. Just think about other things or spend some time with people that care about you, right? Kind of a lot of distractionary um, feedback. Get away from that feeling. So think about ways that you've been engaging in that fixing invalidation and the impact it has had. Shoulds are really common. Shoulds are telling someone they should not feel, think, or act in a certain way. You shouldn't be that upset. You should just get over it. You shouldn't think like that. It's not good for you. You should be better by now. That was days ago. Should, should, should. There's kind of the saying, you should all over yourself. Shoulds are going to amplify the distress. So thinking about what are all the should statements that I tend to make, especially in terms of these crises behaviors. And what kind of impact has that had on my young person? And the last one we're going to cover today is oversimplifying. Oversimplifying is telling someone that they can easily fix their problems, making it seem like it's very simple and straightforward. Kind of that Nike slogan, just do it. Why can't you do it? I can do it all the time. And saying it shouldn't be that hard. Why can't you just do this? You just get an alarm, you set it, and you wake up in the morning. It's kind of oversimplifying the the steps. The steps may be valid and justified, but there's obviously other barriers to engaging in those steps on a consistent basis, consistent and effective basis. So think about what are those types of invalidating statements that you make and what is the impact that it's had on your young person? So what we want to do is remove our invalidation. Like I've said before, we're not ignoring the dysfunction. We're removing the judgment about how we communicate the the behaviors surrounding all of this. So we know that the behavior is not necessarily acceptable or maybe not acceptable, but it's not effective and we don't need to judge it. The judgment will not create effective change. Judgment stops us from effective change. So if we're going to model for our young people to be able to move into effective problem solving, we also need to remove the judgment so they can remove the judgment when they reflect on their own actions and their own emotions and their own thoughts. So again, we need to give corrective feedback, judgments and invalidation. That's not effective feedback. That's a judgmental lens. It's not fact-based. So let's talk about this. When we look at what invalidation does, Alan Frizzetti created um, a program and he, well, a research program that he looked at 
different types of responses to stressful events. So he had two categories of people that were taking a test and it was a math test and it was a very difficult math test, math test that most people couldn't find answers to. Half of them, he had the, the teacher essentially respond with a validating comment and the other half an invalidating comment. And it was just a one sentence response. It was very simple. And what they found was after a stressful event, if they received an invalidating comment, their heart rate and their skin conductance increase in terms of their physiological distress. So what we're looking at is that physiological arousal when we receive invalidation. This is also why we want to stop these behaviors. We want to get out of crises. We want to help our young person be able to self-regulate, then we need to stop increasing the harm and the arousal around it. We can't remove all stressors, but we can certainly remove the parts that are definitely going to keep us from a resolve and from regulation. Get you unstuck from arguments that are super exhausting and circular. It's kind of a time waste. Another downside to invalidating, especially on a frequent basis, is that you're teaching your young person how to be self-invalidating. Self-invalidation will keep them stuck. Whatever they are learning from you about their own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors will integrate into their kind of self-talk. So while you're not in complete control of that, of what those messages are, you can absolutely control yours your script to it and help them learn how to behaviorally identify what is, how to understand their thoughts and feelings so that they can work to change them. <clears throat> and I want you to just kind of think about it. If you're a young person who has more powerful emotions than the people around them and they're consistently being told they're overreacting, they need to kiss change the way that they feel and they should just be able to change the way they feel look around them everybody else is able to be regulated in this moment that doesn't really lend itself to creating effective regulation acceptance over their emotions which is being able to recognize what is is the most important first step towards change if i believe i should just never be angry how am I going to be able to regulate that emotion? I'm going to work really hard to avoiding that emotion, which is going to lead to problematic behaviors. If we practice acceptance and model acceptance that they are experiencing irritation, they're going to be able to figure out strategies to actually regulate that emotion. Acceptance over emotions is at the heart of all emotion regulation strategies. When we think about non-acceptance of emotion, then we know that that plays a huge role in terms of dysregulation. So what we're doing here with this invalidating step is recognizing what are the invalidating comments that I make? How is that impacting crises and dysregulation at home? And what are some of the parts where I think it's kind of the most damaging short-term and long-term to my young person? And can I really practice letting go of those comments. So on your worksheet, you'll have a few steps of goals. What I want you to do is notice the urge to invalidate or notice once you have just invalidated or recently invalidated. Practice using that stop skill. We'll bring in some urge surfing. Urge surfing is I'm noticing I'm having an urge to say this thing and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to sit here and be mindful of the way that it feels and not engage in that behavior, maybe practicing paced breathing and really figuring out a way to move out of invalidation and more into listening, asking questions and opening my mind in a curiosity kind of way. Figuring out how to communicate more effectively, try to use that dear man skill and apologize for any invalidation that I've engaged in. Again, that next step is stop the most damaging. So let's work on the highest intensity in validation. Maybe it's not the exact comment, but maybe it's the timing or the, the frequency of the invalidation. Really looking at what has the most impact in terms of your young person. And then work to keep your invalidating responses down to a low minimum. So maybe you track, you use a diary card yourself, but really monitor how frequent you are engaging in these invalidating comments with your young person and outside of that. So 
best of luck practicing. Thank you.